Hi, and welcome to another episode of Around the Neighborhood with me, Scott McMahon, and this is a show about the quest for fun, history, and mystery in our backyards. And I'm back at the Willamette Summer Market, and I'm definitely going to get some Grammys donuts today. Hopefully there's some horchata left, because the last time I went to that place, if they're around, um, that vendor, you know, the, their batch of horchata um, was almost gone after an hour. And there's plenty of parking here at Les Schwab, so I'm going to park here take a nice stroll up downtown Willamette to see how Bain Street's coming along in terms of all the construction. You can probably hear in the background all the rivets going, um, all the work they're doing at Les Schwab Tires. Anyhow, as I was mentioning, I'm a little late to the market because actually I've been very busy trying to close on a house for a fan of the show, fan of the Around the Neighborhood, who became a client of mine, who has been looking to buy a home here in Willamette. This is where she grew up. And what was interesting about this particular deal is that there are multiple offers that went on this home and you really have to be competitive in this market at this current moment and we weren't the highest priced at all but there are certain things that matter to the people selling the home sometimes and just price alone so we're very fortunate to get the home my client is very happy and i'm happy for her i mean she's really close to the river now and it's uh one of those great hidden benefits about living over here in willamette so although I'm gonna get some food at the market, uh, my wife asked me to pick her up some more cotton candy. She really liked that organic co cotton candy, that's for sure. But um, I'm actually gonna be focusing on the artisans at the, at the market. And there's a number of them that you know, make their own uh, jewelry and some of them take like household items and they put their artistic spin to that. So that's what we're gonna focus on today, um, even though I'll, I'll get some food and treats for sure. When I was trying to do my research for like the history of jewelry jewelry has been around since like the dawn of mankind um, it looks like archaeologists have found probably what they consider the earliest remnants of jewelry in a cave in South Africa that dates back 75,000 years ago 75,000 years ago it's crazy I'm having a hard enough time trying to find information on what happened here in West Lynn 150 years ago so in this cave, some human made a necklace out of small seashells and snail shells. And that was uh, discovered and they were able to date it back 75,000 years ago. So I got my mask ready. It's just that I'm not around anybody just yet, um, but I'm going to be getting closer to some people. So I'm going to have to get this on here soon enough. But uh, another thing I found out about the research about jewelry was the psychology of why we tend to buy jewelry or have jewelry. Um, especially uh, any object that is shiny and glossy. And the study they did was that it is innate in our need for water. So it didn't matter where they did the study, the results were pretty much the same. Uh, humans tend to gravitate towards shiny and glossier items. And with that said, let's head over to the market and see how our local artisans are doing what they do. And let's see some of their art. Have any horchata left? No, sorry. You guys get like sold out like within the no, first we actually, we, don't, we haven't brought it in a little bit, so we, we have these. Oh, okay. For now. We, just, uh, we gotta get that going. We haven't yet. I'll come to, when, when I see the Wednesday, I'll be here next time I see it. I'll get it. Right, cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. Look at you. This is another child. Denise. Denise. <laughs> Hi. Good. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you guys doing? Well. Delicious. I've had it many times since uh, last good. Wednesday. Good. Yeah. Yeah. How's your face? You doing better? Okay, yeah. <laughs> hi. Oh, hi, sweetie. No, it's <laughs> I'll cut it out. <laughs> All right. Hi. How you doing? 
good. So we just like, what can we do to um, to bring more money into the house? And so instead of getting another job, I'm like, why don't we just make our stuff at home to save money? So we ended up making our own laundry soap, our own dishwashing soap. I'd taken a soap making class well before I even met my husband. So I'm like, let's try to do that as well. And then the soap, I am passionate about environmental issues and I wanted to make it without palm oil or animal fat. And so I just researched, 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 and we started with soap. So the soap here is no animal fat or palm oil at all. And then this soap was kind of a happy accident. This soap is made with dissolved salt water um, with organic coconut oil, just plain essential oil. So super simple ingredients. So that was another thing that we invented. From there, I think I was low on magnesium. So I'm like, I want to start doing baths, but I didn't want to just do a magnesium soap. So I started researching how to make bath bombs. And I'm like, oh, there's one ingredient that has palm. I wonder if I can change that. Well, I did. Um, the bath bombs um, have a coconut derivative bubble bath, shea butter, um, they're magnificent and they're different from any bath bomb that anyone has ever made. Since I make it different, it makes these little tiny balls. So this product is that deconstructed. And then I'm pretty generous. Our bath bombs are so big, moms are like, they're too big. So I'm like, well, why don't we do this so moms can sprinkle it in. So I've got ginormous bath bombs for a person like me with a big tub or portion controlled bath bombs, mix and match like sand art. We do $5 each or six for 25. Again, we're generous and uh, basically wholesale prices. The jars are $5 and then you bring them back for a $4 refill. So it's basically, I we had hardship starting it and then we reinvented the wheel. I put in my passion, my environmentally uh, conscious uh, products and then my generosity all into one magnificent business. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it looks like. All right, cool. Yep. And then this goes in yeah. like monkey parts. Yep, Fruit Loops. And then you, you can do your own. Oh, so you're going to combine. Yeah, so you can do, it's just like sand art, but usable. So usable sand art. So it's got blueberry. shea butter in there. It's got Epsom salt. It's got the color. So blueberry. And then you can do the coconut on top. I'm just going to do a couple over and over the stripes. Just like Ching's Mingle and Grill, whatever you put on your plate is what you're responsible to eat. It's strawberry jam. The strawberry jams was so good. It's my favorite. And the fun fact too, I hand blend all these colors. So all the colors that you see are basically with primary colors and I just kind of mix them. Coconut again. We'll call her One Nation. Super cute. Can I put some in your water? We can get it to fuzz up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. We got and then we've got the instructions right under the lid, but basically add to water. And then you could get bubbles if you put it under the run running water. It's bath bomb in a jar. You could take it by because it's bath bomb in a jar. I think it's all ready for you right there, huh? Yep. You're like, I gotta sell another one. <laughs> <laughs> sell it or use it. <laughs> so these are the ingredients. So that's the blueberry. And then I just keep on Caribbean coconuts, the white one. Oh, wow. Yeah. And strawberry jam. Jamming. You'll be jamming with you. Done. Nice. Well, I can uh, attest that when you open the lid on that, the smell, the aroma was like, oh. Yeah. That was, it was legit. You can't, yeah. you know, I also smell through the video, but yeah. trust me, you can smell it. You need smell vision Yeah. <laughs> hey, Marshall, how are you? <laughs> Thanks, sir. Hi, how are you? Good. Hey, yo. Hey, how you doing? Oh, fantastic. I, oh, you got some more of uh, the new, the lemon loaves and all this stuff that yeah, I didn't get last time. Yeah, blueberry, and we have carrot cake with walnuts, Whoa. without walnuts. And these new cookies, which are really delicious. Hummingbird cookies. Oh. Unfortunately, we gave away our last sample. That's okay. <laughs> all right, I'll see you guys soon. <laughs> Is this, all, is this all handmade or how does it? Totally uh, handmade. Totally handmade. Only yeah. full grain leather. All my work is totally, totally hand. By hand, stitch by hand, cut by hand. I don't use mechanic tools or a sewing machine. This is my sewing machine actually. Oh. I stopped doing leather in 78. I learned it like a craft from German crafters down in Transylvania in Europe. Are you kidding? That's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you learned it that long ago, 
but it, you know, then you found your way back to this process. And so this must be reminiscent, if I'm correct, of what you learned back in the late 70s yes. in Transylvania, is that right? Yes. Well, that is a great story. That's a great story. I have more, I have an Etsy shop where I have even more. I have, like you can see, planters or, uh, you know, for a yoga mat, oh, stuff for water bottle, for, but right now it's, it's what I have here. We need more young people doing trying to learn that doing this because it's so bad, you know, this is stuff which only a full hand of people can do it, you know, or are still doing by hand, you know. Everybody want to use a machine, want to use... Let's do something with our hand, let's feel again the leather, let's feel again that pleasure, you know. It's nice to have the old ways of the, the master and apprentice, the artisan and the craftsmanship being handed down, and that, that skill set is very rare. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. So well, hello. Hi, you're here. Well, I'm here, and today is like your day. And I'm <laughs> focusing on all the artisans. We talked earlier in the first Wednesday, but if you can kind of give me a rundown again, how you got started, how did you end up here, and what do you call this? Um, so I actually used to be a dog trainer, and I got where I was like, nope, can't do it anymore. One dog just tried to like eat me, so I was like, okay, I'm done. So then my boyfriend was like, well, why don't you do something that you like to work with in, you know, like a craft, because I love, I always loved crafts as a kid. And my dad's like a carpenter, so working with his hands, and um, yeah, so I, I started seeing a lot of stuff on resin, so I started, I did about a year's worth of research before I even bought anything, because it's very expensive. Um, and I was very nervous, it's very fickle, like you just mix it wrong and it's never going to cure. And so I started off in a spare bathroom, just using the countertop that was in there, and then I moved to a walk-in closet, and then I moved into a spare bedroom. So it's been a bit of an adventure. <laughs> so I, I've seen her with like the mask and the gloves and the fumes. I'm familiar with uh, fiberglass and uh, resin. So the resin, a lot of them say, oh, they're safe to breathe, but when you heat them up, the chemicals actually change and it's very harmful to breathe. So yeah, I have a, a respirator with the cartridges as well as goggles and then gloves. I have double glove because I really don't want it on my skin. And then I wear <laughs> I wear plastic um, butcher's overalls because it starts to go through anything I wear if I touch my um, clothing with it. So I can just peel it off as it builds up. Uh, but yeah, and then I have um, a bunch of fans in there to push all the um, fumes outside. <laughs> so what was the first thing that you were started to do uh, craftswise? Was it these um, um, so, like beach boards or was it the smaller? So initially I started out with all the beach stuff and I always had that little bit of resin left in the cup and it was just hardening and going to waste. So I thought, oh, what if I just made, threw it in a little mold of some sort. So I bought, I think my very first one was the Pikachu mold actually. Um, and those are my best sellers. I literally cannot keep them made at this point, and I'm down to one mold. So, yeah, I have them. But yeah, I just use that last bit of resin, and the kids love them. Because <laughs> they all kind of turn out differently. The resin kind of does what it wants. I don't always have full control over what it's doing. Uh, you can see in this one, the, the tray wasn't completely um, flat, so it kind of flowed this way. And, you know, kind of like water, it flowed how it wanted to. Humans are drawn to shiny, glossy objects. Did you read about this? No, but that totally makes sense. It, it, I totally it's, believe it. They, were, they realized that the it was based off of um, the innate need that humans have for water. Yeah. So the fact that you have glossy objects, which is the resin, but literally it's water, yeah. that's what maybe what I was attracted to. It. I don't know, I thought it was faster when I found uh, that report and I was reading it, I was like, I'm gonna, it's like Nicole's work. So we're like birds. Yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, I really think the blue against the wood is just my favorite. These ones are olive wood. Um, and I think the design in the olive wood just makes the resin pop so much better. Great. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. First thing 
I was attracted to was beads, like little tiny seed beads, just uh, as a kid. And uh, I started making uh, things like this, um, where it's uh, woven together or sewn together. And uh, it just kind of went from there. I started liking more and more gemstones and pearls and collecting. Uh, Divine Dragon is kind of a, a nod to my, uh, my heritage. And, uh, you know, in Thailand, they, they, have, they don't have their own dragons, but I think they adopted the Chinese dragon. She just mentioned Thailand. Yeah. I'm half Thai. Oh, okay. So it's not any <laughs> I only have one hand, so I can do that. <laughs> well, that's fascinating because you're talking about the dragons. They have, um, well, they have like the water festival yeah. and like the water serpent, so very nice. Yeah. yeah, so that's that's kind of my inspiration. It's a combination of the stones themselves because I want them to be, uh, you know, on display and not necessarily compete with the um, centerpiece, but the centerpiece is really kind of the focal point. And so um, my my goal is to have it complement each other, uh, but when you look at a piece to see a very unique, you know, appreciate the foreground and the background. So this piece right here uh, is Labradorite. Mm -hmm. And uh, Labradorite has a really cool history with uh, the Inuit. They have a legend that one of their famous warriors bold, threw his spear into the sky and at the uh, Aurora Borealis. And what came down is what became the stone, Labradorite. Yeah. Uh, okay. High association with that. Oh, uh, that's good stuff. Like I said, this is... Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> what are these from? These look familiar. Um, so th that's probably off a cookie tin. Oh, yeah. A cookie tin. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, Sue. Thank and uh, Saudi Crop. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's, we, what's the name of the company? Uh, it's Pake Goods. And it's kind of a mix of my name and my mom's name. And just she's sort of the inspiration to kind of do what you love. Yeah. You'll hear the generator in the back. So, but there's a way that I can sort of um, use an effect to sort of drown it out. So if this segment, if the audio sounds a little different, it's because I have to drown out that back there. Actually, it started off pretty simple. I was looking for a Mount Hood necklace and just something simple, something that I just wanted to wear myself. And by looking at different artists and different places in and around Portland, I couldn't find one that I liked. So I said, you know what, I'm just going to make it. <laughs> Because I, I have a background in art, um, and I basically just have always made stuff for friends and family for the holidays. So I just decided to go ahead and uh, make a Mount Hood necklace just for myself, and I ended up sharing some with some friends. And basically that's kind of how it got started, is that we ended up doing the Portland Saturday Market, and just kind of starting to do things from there. But like the places you visited, Oregon, you were then having a creative outlet to share with people um, through your work. And uh, in some weird way, this is the video show, allows me to share just neighborhood adventures. So this is really great. Are you able to like sell this at like Made in Oregon? Because it seems so fitting for that kind of store. Yeah, well we sell at Timberline Lodge. And then, uh, so that's our big one. And then um, actually this year we did get asked to be in Made in Oregon, but the uh, date of our um, person to come and check everything out was the day like that the state closed. <laughs> so that was kind of, yeah, but maybe next year and maybe you know, in the future, we can be in other stores too. We got to hear your story again. How did this all start? Uh, Tell us the story. My mother thought I thought of the idea of setting up like a store. Now I was thinking of lemonade, and then my parents said, how about bath bombs and sugar scrubs? And then I asked, what are sugar scrubs? Oh, what did I tell you? <laughs> and they told me what sugar scrubs were. And then my, then my mom started making our first bath bombs. 
What are those? The sugar scrubs. Oh, the scrubs, okay. And then she thought up of the bath salts, like cool lavender. And then if you come over here, she made body bombs like lavender truffle and chocolate truffle. And then the tea rose. So did you guys, um, did you have a background in making uh, bath suds before or just because the art is very nice, the design is very clean, do you have a background in design and art um, as well? I do have a background in, uh, in artistry, I'm a photographer, um, but actually making, making everything is actually kind of a recent hobby for me. So I studied, I studied for a while on uh, soaps and then I just started trying my hand at it and found I really liked doing it as a creative outlet. Uh, which soaps do the kids like, you know, when they take baths and showers? This, the underworld is her favorite. She's really, she's really attracted to the underworld, which is more of a masculine scent. Yeah, that's my favorite. <laughs> um, they've actually been using a lot of the body, the like the bath bombs are kind of like the, um, you know, like our guinea pigs where they'll try them out and tell us how they, you know, the quality control and stuff like that. And then uh, we had some uh, rubber ducky soaps for kids here, but they all sold out today. Where's the fun part of like coming up with the different names and the, and the story behind the soaps? Um, uh, for some reason, I decided to go with a, like a Greek myth. I've been really into Greek mythology since I was a kid, so I decided to go into more of like Greek mythology themes. So, of course, we have Underworld, which is Hades, Sea King, which is Poseidon, um, Spring Maiden, which is Persephone, uh, Juno, which is Hera, um, Harvest Mother, which is Demeter, and then um, Sweet Lady Venus is Aphrodite. And there is scents, uh, the scent that I put in the soap uh, kind of reflects um, which aspect or personification of nature they represent. So Underworld, you know, is like, is like black salt and cypress and smells very, you know, it's colored with uh, activated charcoal, so it's very dark. And Sea King is abalone and sea. Well, my name is Awa Sheikh Saif, and I've been a volunteer for over 12 years, taking assignment and uh, helping women artisans. So finally, I ended up uh, creating this organization. It's a very innovative company, and uh, we, I work closely with the women, because usually the, uh, the training I give them is to do the marketing side, you know, how they do have the skill, how would they be able to sell it overseas. So that's, uh, that's why I create the Women Artisan Resource Enterprise. Uh, it's a resource for buyers in the US, but it's also an enterprise for women because they make the handmade product and I sell them here. So basically, it's that. It's wonderful. I have a Ghana project from Ghana, from Rwanda, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, uh, Zambia. And for instance, I can show you this one are from, this, this, this were a project when I went to Zimbabwe and I find a group of young people and I ask them, hey, I live in Oregon. Why don't you make something with music? And they design that. So those are things that uh, I will bring to them uh, so they can be more creative and sell their product. Nice. And I'm based in uh, Southeast uh, Portland, uh, at, uh, between uh, Arthur and Madison, 11 Avenue. My daughter's favorite boulevard, Hawthorne Boulevard. Ah, it's very artsy there. Yeah. How do you, the, I want to make sure I pronounce your name correctly. Hawa Shek. Hawa Shek. Yes. Hawa Shek. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hawa Shek, she had to, she, by her own um, desire, she wanted to make sure that she had their mask off so she can, so all of us could um, understand her, that's what she said. But I thought she did great. 
I can't even understand myself. Um, speak, and I speak, I, I'm from here. <laughs> and uh, while I was uh, empowering as, as a woman, mm -hmm. talented woman, I, it motivated me to return to school. So I earned my bachelor's degree at Merrill Hurst, and just last December, I earned my master's degree in business. So it's a win-win situation. Both sides will gain something. This story of the young people that you work with mm -hmm. yes. to do this, that's mm -hmm. a great story. Yes, because they, they, they have the skill of doing all those beats, but having an idea of doing music. So they start doing guitar player and xylophone, as you can see, keyboarding. So they become so creative and they can add, they expand their collection instead of making only uh, yeah, uh, lizard. But the funny thing is, and I say, why they're not straight? Oh, they're having a good time because they are all crooked. Oh, they're having a good time. So they, they, they are young people. If they don't have a, a sense to make something in their life, they just become delinquent. There is nothing else to do. So this recognize that they are talented and they can generate income out of this. I'm, I'm assuming that the different pieces, mm -hmm. um, do they represent the, like a different style of the regions? Um, yes, and, um, and the idea, the whole idea is to preserve the tradition. At the same time, to be able for them to sell outside their local country, Sometimes we make it a contemporary art like this one. This, each, each piece has a story. Leather work is a kind of a intensive, labor intensive. So usually it's a men work, even so the organization focus on women. But we want to be inclusive to men. So, but the fabric comes from the women. So why not to make something and you claim, men, young men can claim it's their art, but women also because the fabric is made by, it's a hand dye by women. So that's how we work. And these are from Mali. Most people don't know Mali, but we have the beautiful city of Timbuktu mm. in Mali. Yes. Mm. So this is an example. And some of the basket, the women make it because they knew they have that skill. But usually it's a raise fun to build a, a school and also take care of themselves and the children. These are from uh, Kenya, they are a soapstone from Kenya. Laser worker, people who make the purses, they always have a remnant pieces. I say, go collect that, it's free. But think of something and make it. They just surprise me by making a bracelet. See, those are bracelets. And so they, they, have, they just need someone who can bring, give them, who believe in them first and also bring a little of technique, you know. It's a communal work. They all do together. Everybody do that in the big tree, baobab tree. Everyone and the young men will do the laser work. These are from Ghana, oh. and I have the basket from Zambia. And uh, I have the Wanda one, but I don't think, I think I sold all the Wanda, but these are Wanda. Oh. And, it depends on the country, the fiber depends. We have uh, those are palm leaf, and also they have uh, uh, it's not a reed, these are reed from Ghana, these are sisal. So each country has a different fiber. Hmm. They use that, which is good because it's a resources, natural resources they use, but they do not deplete it, the environment. You know, we, I myself look closely and make sure that they don't use chemicals that really will affect them, but also will affect the environment. Everything is just beautiful. Yeah, because uh, we really tend to supply museum gift shops because mm. they don't want quantity, but they want quality. And because I've been teaching, I've been training them to make the base of the project because I have an eye and I also develop a project for them. Uh, I am so proud to showcase only the beautiful one. 
And a lot of customers give me the feedback. They say it's really professionally done. <laughs> no, so Alice Shek, she did a great job. Your pronunciation was fantastic. You could actually, you know, see. Like I said, I've been doing this show, and people who are following my show know that I can't pronounce a lot of English words. And it's because I made fun of my mom for too long. She's from Thailand. <laughs> She's so, from she, Thailand. so I would make fun of her English. And now karma's hit me, <laughs> and I can't speak English anymore either. All right. Well, I'll let you get going okay. to, to wrap Thank everything up. It's so, so much. wonderful and to meet you. And your name again is Scott. Scott. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Merci. McMahon. Merci yeah. Beaucoup. Oh, look at this French. Oui, yeah, French. I like that. <laughs> Well, I did a lot of damage at the market today. I got some donuts, some Grammys, um, some more cotton candy for the family. A sweet overload for sure. Another thing I should probably point out is that at the market here, we've got uh, kind of a narrow street. So they're trying to keep all the guests uh, on the edges as best they can, you know, to keep the roadway clear for the cars, you know, to come around the corner. There are signs posted along the entrance to the market, just letting people know caution. You know, there are pedestrians, but also caution, to try to get the people off the street you know, so you're not jamming up the traffic for the cars that need to come through. It's a little harder for the, you know, the residents that live here and the market's doing their best to adapt to the changes. Like I said, it's not their normal location. They would be normally along Main Street. So they're making do with the best they can with the vendors and trying to move forward in a safe way during this COVID-19 uh, lockdown. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this particular episode. And since the show is sponsored by my real estate services, all my contact information is below in case you're looking to buy or sell a home. Uh, like a, just a recent client of mine where we are you know, closing on a home right here in Willamette. Anyway, for everybody else, you can head over to aroundtheneighborhood.tv and you can get more videos there as well as sign up to become a fan. Again, that's at aroundtheneighborhood.tv. And uh, yeah. I guess I'll see you around the neighborhood after I eat some of this sugary goodness. <laughs>